Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Alan Bach. I'm with the Epilepsy Foundation, Eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, thanks for being here tonight. Tonight, we're, this presentation is the advances in surgical options for epilepsy with Dr. Michael Sather speaking. Just a little background about the our, our organization. We've been in, in, this is our service area. We've been in business for 50 years. We're local independent affiliate of the Epilepsy Foundation of America. And we serve these 18 counties of Eastern Pennsylvania primarily. Um, and we provide a wide range of different programs and services. So if you're here tonight uh, to hear about the surgical options for epilepsy, just keep in mind that we can help you with in various areas that you may be looking for help, including support groups, other educational conferences, retreats, and camps, uh, information and referrals and consultations. So we're here to, to serve the needs of people of all ages with, and families with epilepsy. Dr. Sather is a neurosurgery specialist in Hershey, Pennsylvania. He graduated from the University of Nebraska College of Medicine in 2002. He completed his epilepsy surgery, surgery fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Sather serves as the surgery director of the Penn State Comprehensive Epilepsy Center and is a full pro professor of neurosurgery at Penn State Comprehensive Epilepsy Center. He has been practicing at Penn State Hershey since 2009. Dr. Sather is married and has a daughter in high school and a son in middle school. Thanks for coming, Dr. Sather. I'm going to unshare my screen so he can share his. Thanks for coming out. Thank you for the invitation and for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for being here. You see all my slides now here, Ellen? Yes, yes, we do. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for oh, coming. I forgot to mention, if anyone has any questions, just go to the chat box at the bottom. We're gonna save those questions till the end. Um, and so it's right at the bottom there, it says chat, sorry. Uh, no problem. Uh, yeah, so thank you again for the invitation and thank you all for being here to listen. Um, uh, thanks for coming to listen to this talk about surgical options for epilepsy, specifically uh, advances. Um, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. I did an epilepsy surgery fellowship because I believe in, you know, being able to offer epilepsy patients help, and I believe in what what surgery can do for for those patients who don't don't respond well to medications. And as you'll see. Uh, in one of the slides, there's about a million people in the United States who don't uh, respond well to medical therapy who continue to have seizures. So I wanted to, here's an outline of the talk today. I want to get a, begin with the end in mind, which just means we're going to start with the uh, conclusion. I'm going to give you essentially what I feel are, are the advances that have taken place. Um, and when I was asked to give this talk about advances in epilepsy surgery, uh, I'm, I'm using in my mind sort of the advances that I've seen in my practice here at Penn State in the last 14, 15 years since, since fellowship. What's different in the landscape of how we treat um, epilepsy from a surgical standpoint? Um, and so I'm gonna kind of go over a number of things uh, with you today that I think are, are different and, and some thoughts I have about the future. Uh, in specific, you'll see that uh, along this talk that things tend to come in twos. Um, so I'll kind of point some of those things out just for, for trying to remember some of these things. Um, we'll talk about why surgery is sometimes necessary, where surgery performs, specifically uh, level four epilepsy centers. We'll talk about the pre-surgical workup, even though not much has changed with the pre-surgical workup as far as what's needed to work a patient up to have safe surgery. Um, some things have changed, such as our uh, ability to understand the EEG and our ability to understand what's happening during a seizure. So, so being able to determine on the video EEG where a seizure might be coming from and also the quality of the MRI. Um, we'll talk about uh, specifically two different types of surgery, one for, for diagnosis, so what we call invasive monitoring, and the other surgery for doing some kind of treatment. And those treatments can be something either that we deem, deem as something that's potentially curative, like a resection or removal of abnormal tissue or an ablation. And then something where we, we often don't uh, arrive at seizure freedom, uh, although it's possible. Um, it generally, uh, we try to optimize or improve uh, seizures as much as possible with a type of stimulation called neuromodulation. And then we'll talk about the outcomes with regards to 
uh, these different types of surgeries, and then we'll go back to the conclusion that we started with in the beginning. So what's new in epilepsy? Well, we have uh, Im improved MRIs. Uh, the quality of the MRI is able to better find lesions, and I put lesions in quotes simply because some of these are not necessarily tumors or anything uh, like that. Some of these are just ab abnormal areas of cortical development, which can be subtle on imaging. Um, we have less invasive ways to place electrodes in the brain so that invasive monitoring has become less invasive. So there's stereo EEG instead of requiring a, a large craniotomy to place grids. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we have um, more tailored resections because of this advent of stereo EEG and then better MRI scans. We can focus in a little bit more and sometimes make those resections a little bit smaller. Um, we're, robots are relatively new in the, in the avenue of, uh, and in the operating room. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about using robots and how I use robotic guidance in the operating room. Talk about all the advances that have been taking place in neuromodulation, specifically with the advent of DBS being approved for epilepsy treatment in the last few years, and then RNS being uh, a, a type of closed loop stimulation that is available and uh, has been now for, I think, somewhere around 10 years. Um, <clears throat> Uh, laser treatment as an option for epilepsy surgery. So we'll talk about that, a minimally invasive way to treat seizures. Um, and essentially, we have more options now for, for patients with epilepsy when we can't do a resection than we used to in the past. So I'll touch on that. And then finally, um, in essence, I you know epilepsy surgery is continuing to evolve to become less, uh, less invasive, less risky, and, and even more beneficial than in the past. So yeah, here's some of the rules of twos that you'll see throughout this is that there's two reasons that we consider surgery for epilepsy, two basic categories of epilepsy surgery they'll touch on, two reasons for invasive monitoring or stereo EEG. Um, most of the devices that we're going to talk about are composed of two essential parts, and the devices can function in two, one of two basic ways, either an open or a closed loop system, which we'll talk about what that means. Um, most of these devices are not activated right away, but uh, usually after a couple weeks. Um, and then some surgical interventions are a two-stage process. And then there's two basic goals of surgical treatment for epilepsy. So here's the first rule of two. What's the rationale or the reason that we do surgery? Well, we know that epilepsy negatively impacts quality of life. Um, and we also know that not everybody is well controlled with medications. So Here's a slide I was telling you about, about 3.4 million Americans have epilepsy and about 1 million of those are refractory to medical management. Um, data also shows that, you know, in 90% of patients say they have an impact of their epilepsy on their quality of life. So the reason for surgery is that we really want to improve the quality of life and not everybody uh, is going to be seizure free with medications and so, so surgery is necessary in some instances. So what do I mean by medically refractory? Well, this slide's not, uh, or, or this paper's not real, all that new. It uh, came out in 2000, uh, in the year 2000, New England Journal of Medicine. But if you look here, the biggest piece of the pie here at 47%, at 47% um, of patients are seizure-free with the first medication. So right there, about half patients become seizure-free. And then in the green pie, you see about if those patients, the ones that aren't seizure-free get a second medication, Another 13% of patients become seizure-free. And then there's this uh, sort of law of diminishing returns where with the third medication, you're really not capturing a lot of patients. So most, most uh, neurologists will tell you that, you know, when, when we get patients with, uh, there, who are still having seizures on two medications or more, you're essentially failing medical management. And that's really about a third of patients. So here at Penn State, we're a level four epilepsy center. So that's where you know a lot of uh, epilepsy surgery in the country is being done. A level four epilepsy centers in a nutshell offer all the latest advanced diagnostic and treatment options that, I, that I'm gonna talk about in this. It's the, it's the highest level awarded by the National Association of Epilepsy Centers. Level three epilepsy centers do offer uh, epilepsy surgery as well. They just don't offer the whole, um, whole spectrum of, of treatments uh, and workup. So at, for instance, at a level three epilepsy center, um, most of them don't do responsive neurostimulation. Most of them don't do invasive monitoring. Uh, the other thing that's unique about a level four epilepsy center is, is in our center, we work off this multidisciplinary framework. So, you know, we sit down and we talk about patients who are being worked up, 
who have not responded well to medical management and talk about uh, their all their data up to this point and, and make basically treatment decisions as a group um, and individualize that to each patient because each patient is different. Each patient um, presents with a diff different spectrum of uh, uh, seizures and where those seizures are coming from and what they look like and their intractability and their medications and such. So the pre-surgical workup, as I said, it hasn't, hasn't changed much. These are the three facets that are still really important. Uh, we call this uh, anatomo electro clinical method, um, essentially looking at the anatomic variables, electrical data, uh, and clinical data. So from an anatomy standpoint, we're looking at um, the MRI scan, we're looking for any potential lesions in the brain, putting that together with the EEG, what happens during a seizure and, and, uh, and between seizures. And then we're looking for clinically, we're looking at the video aspect of the EEG, what's happening during a seizure. Um, we're also getting that history from a patient who um, has awareness during their seizures, what they feel and what they notice going on. And then otherwise for, for patients that have loss of awareness, we talk to the family about what do you see normally when, when they have a seizure. So we put all that together to come up with this hypothesis about where the seizure is coming from and where it's spreading to. And in this area of um, or onset and then early spread is called the epileptogenic areas. Um, and that epileptogenic area is a network. So it's not like a single spot. So we don't think of it, think of this as a spot. We think about it as a network because essentially it's starting in, in a location and then spreading through this network. And so it, we know from data that it's important to get out the area of onset and early propagation as well. If you don't get out the area of early propagation with a resective surgery, then it, usually the patient's not going to be seizure free. So another way to look, look at the epileptogenic area is to think about this as the area that we need to remove in order for a patient to be seizure free. So we can sort of determine this by putting all these things together. So we're looking at the, what's happening during a seizure, looking at um, the, the signs and symptoms, uh, as well as the EEG, how it evolves and how it seems to spread from one location to another, one region to another, one hemisphere to another. Uh, here's one of the other rules of two. There's two different categories of epilepsy surgery. Uh, we can break that down into surgery for localization, which is the invasive monitoring that I mentioned. And that is we're trying to get more data before we can move forward with the surgical treatment. Uh, the other category is, is surgery for treatment. Uh, now, a lot of patients, the good news is a lot of patients can, and can pursue surgery for treatment without needing surgery for localization. So, so not everybody needs invasive monitoring. It's a, uh, less common to, to need that, certainly common enough, uh, but most patients are able to pursue epilepsy surgery without the need for invasive monitoring. We'll get into the, the reason for doing the invasive monitoring um, in, uh, shortly. Um, from a standpoint of surgery for treatment, um, the, the two basic categories for this, another rule of twos, is that the, we're either trying to cure the, the seizures um, or we can't do a resection or ablation, so we can't remove tissue because of the risk of it. Uh, and then the goal is maximum seizure control, not always seizure free. Sometimes in some instances of stimulation, patients become seizure free, but not, not, um, not to a high incidence. Um, so the goal in that is seen as controlling the network. We're trying to optimize the uh, to the seizure control for a patient to be able to give them the best quality of life possible. So we get into surgery for localization then, we'll kind of break that down and a little bit, um, refer to this as invasive monitoring. Uh, I refer to it as invasive because, it is, um, because it's in contrast to the scalp EEG, which is a non-invasive modality. So it involves surgical implantation of electrodes on or in the brain. Um, so I'll show a, a slide of this. We'll talk about that. Um, we only employ that when we need more information to be able to proceed with surgical treatment. So, and the two reasons for that. So another rule of two is, is that um, we need to further refine the area of onset. So in other words, we, we think we know where it's coming from, uh, but the scalp EEG is not specific enough to be able to give us the data we need to pursue a safe uh, surgery strategy. Uh, the second reason would be we, the seizure onset, we know, and, but uh, it seems to be very close to a, an area uh, that, that is important that we re really can't take out, like an area that controls motor function or speech. Um, 
And these days, as I've already brought up this terminology of stereoelectroencephalography, uh, that's SEEG. Um, most days, the, um, the invasive monitoring that we're doing is stereo EEG. Uh, we are not uh, very often putting grids or subdural grids in at this, at this point. So this is what robotic guided stereo EEG looks like. It's, um, uh, it's robotic in nature, meaning that there's a robotic assistant that I utilize. So this stereotactic arm will actually, um, once, it's, uh, once I uh, enter all the data, um, once I enter the, the patient's uh, images in the system and all the planning that I've done, there's usually about an hour or two of planning that I go through uh, to plan a patient's electrodes out. That data gets input in there. And then once uh, the robot is registered to the patient's anatomy in the operating room after they're asleep, the robotic arm will drive into the position then able to place the electrode through the robotic arm here. Um, so essentially what you have, rather than doing an open surgery and making a big incision and removing bone and then exposing a bunch of brain um, to put a sheet of electrodes on the surface of the brain is you have a less invasive way to do this by placing multiple electrodes um, through small little stab incisions in the, in the skin and a small little opening in the skull. Uh, the wire is about, the, about like, a, like a thin piece of spaghetti, um, like that angel hair pasta. So it's a very thin um, electrode. And you can see that if you place multiple electrodes and they're going from the, the surface of the brain somewhere deep, and then you spread those out in space, you can imagine in your mind uh, that this develops some three-dimensional uh, space uh, inside the brain. Uh, well, inside that three-dimensional space should be the area where we deem uh, that the seizures are coming from so that we know that we have everything covered uh, where the seizures might be coming from and where they might be spreading. So we can utilize this as a, a 3D EEG. Essentially, it's looking at um, where a seizure starts, where it spreads, looking at like these train tracks map here that you see so you can try and determine how does a train get from New York to Chicago to Los Angeles. Um, I, I like this model here. This is, a, um, this is a white matter model. So the white matter pathways are sort of like the highways and byways in, in the brain. It's how information travels from one lobe to another, from one side of the brain to another, and from one location in the brain to another. Um, and so you can imagine these electrodes um, up at the top here entering the brain and, and being in and around all this white matter is that uh, these EEG um, electrodes are picking up uh, electrical data from seizures uh, as they're traversing through the brain to help us to identify where those seizures are coming from. So I told you we'd be talking about outcomes. So here's the data behind it. So it's important to have data behind anything you do. So the effectiveness of stereo EEG is that 97% of the time we can localize where the seizures are coming from with stereo EEG. Um, the data also shows you that utilizing robotics um, with stereo EEG increases the speed compared to an accuracy compared to uh, frame-based placement. So putting on a head frame, putting on a head frame and then placing the electrodes through the frame and then changing all the parameters on a frame takes about three times as long. It's basically a surgery that would take all day as, a, as opposed to a couple of hours. Um, it also lowers the complication rates to, to less than 1% um, for the procedure. When it comes to the surgical treatments then, now that we've talked about the, uh, the reasons that we'd per perform surgery for invasive monitoring, Again, we're looking at optimizing versus, versus curative, so we're going to get into those. Um, we're going to start with uh, neuromodulation or devices. So it's important to understand that these devices are, are two-part systems. So there's a, there's a generator, which some people call the battery. Some people just call it the metal box. It's essentially the device, uh, the portion of the device that, um, that, that, uh, that it, where the electrical signal comes from. Um, that generates the electrical signal, and it also includes the software and, and hardware components. Uh, sort of, it's the brains of the systems, if you will. And then the the lead is nothing more than the conduit for how how the electricity travels from the uh, generator to the end organ, whether that be the brain in the case of deep brain stimulation or responsive neurostimulation, or the nerve uh, in the case of vagus nerve stimulation. So again two-part devices, a generator and, and lead or leads, depending on the device. 
and the other rule of twos with regards to these neuromodulation devices that they can be either open loop systems or closed loop systems. So an open loop system is a non-feedback system. So it's sort of uh, the device is sending electrical impulses and it's, it's kind of, it's pretty much agnostic to what's going on with the brain or the nerve. So in the case of vagus nerve simulation, the device is sending an impulse to the nerve um, and, it, and it keeps doing so regardless of what's going on with regards to any seizures or such. Uh, a closed system on the other hand is a, what we call a feedback system or an auto-correcting uh, system. So the device is, so in the instance of a responsive neurostimulator, uh, the device has uh, electrodes that are listening to the EEG. Um, and then uh, when there's a seizure, the device is capable of noticing the, that um, uh, the EEG change uh, and then sending an electrical signal back to the brain uh, to be able to modify things. So it's, so it's recording and um, sending stimulation. So it's, so it's why, that's why we call it closing the loop. Um, and so it's a feedback system. So these are the three neuromodulation devices and we'll get into a little bit more detail of, uh, about them on, on their individual slides. Um, it's uh, all, all these acronyms here, DBS, deep brain stimulation, RNS, responsive neurostimulation, and then VNS or vagus nerve stimulation. So when would we use which device? It's always a difficult question, um, but there are some, some situations where, where, the, um, where, where it becomes kind, kind of obvious. So deep brain stimulation and responsive neurostimulation are both dev devices placed in the brain. So in the case of vagus nerve stimulation, which is placed in the neck, on the, on the vagus nerve in the neck, uh, we would do that in cases where patients uh, can't have cranial surgery or just decide that it's just not something they want to pursue. Um, the, um, also, in some cases, we don't know where the seizures are coming from. Uh, in the case of deep brain stimulation, the electrodes are always placed in the thalamus. In the case of the vagus nerve stimulation, the, nerve, the stimulator device is always placed on the vagus nerve. So it's not important necessarily for those two devices to know exactly where the seizures are coming from to be able to use those two modalities to treat the seizures. RNS, on the other hand, it's important to know where the uh, seizures are coming from because we have to place the electrodes in the areas of where the seizures are coming from to be able to record the seizures uh, to be able to have that feedback system. <clears throat> Um, so in the case of RNS, uh, also uh, we're limited to treating two uh, areas of seizure onset, uh, whereas DBS and, and VNS, because they are sort of a more generalized uh, stimulation, uh, it does not matter the number of, of seizure onset areas, uh, both stimulators can, systems can treat those type of seizures. So I'll start with uh, DBS, just, uh, just in alphabetical order here. Uh, deep brain stimulation is like the picture in the upper right here, where the electrodes are, are shown in, in red on this uh, three-dimensional rendering from the, the patient's CAT scan. You can see these, why it's called deep brain stimulation. These electrodes essentially are symmetric in, in the middle of the head, one on each side. Um, here in the, uh, at the bottom right-hand side, you're seeing a sort of a schematic of where this electrode is going. It's going at the to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, this ANT, which is the uh, is a, is a nucleus on the top of the thalamus. The thalamus being a, a relay station on the top of the brain stem, so on the on the near the top of the brain. As you can see, this MRI here's the here's the lead showing up on on that in that portion. The brain stem being down here, the thalamus capping that, and then the anterior nucleus of the thalamus just just the icing on top of that. Um, and so it's it's. Uh, uniform and symmetric on, on each side going into that. Uh, there are so many connections to the thalamus from, from every lobe and every hemisphere um, and in multiple locations in the, in the brain, the thalamus being a relay station that getting stimulation in the thalamus, you can get stimulation throughout the whole brain. So what's, again, here, here's some data. So like I said, it's important to have the data. So we have sort of three groupings of data. First on the, on the left-hand side where it says seizure onset. Um, this is looking at what is the seizure reduction by lobe of the brain. And you can see that um, for the temporal lobe epilepsy, the seizure reduction is around 76% uh, over, over the five years. 
And then uh, frontal lobe, it's a little bit less at 60%. And then again, around 70% for the parietal and occipital lobes. Um, and the other thing you'll notice is that uh, these bars, the light blue is year one and the, the dark bar is year five. Uh, what you'll see in, in all the data I show you for all three types of uh, neurostimulation devices is that you'll see this, um, uh, this seizure reduction and increase over time. And that's just the, the interplay between the stimulator and the, and the brain over time, how that it's modulating that network. Um, this other grouping is uh, in reference to patients with the deep brain stimulation and how they, how they do in, in relationship to whether or not they've had a vagus nerve stimulator in the past before. Uh, and 70% regardless. So if the patients had a VNS um, or not, just because they didn't respond to the VNS, for instance, doesn't mean they wouldn't respond to deep brain stimulation. Uh, same here, just because a patient may have had a prior epilepsy surgery, like a resection of some kind that maybe they still have seizures, doesn't mean they wouldn't respond well to uh, DBS with a 70% chance of, uh, or 70% seizure reduction. So we're going to move into the second one here, responsive neurostimulation. This is what this looks like in a schematic here on the right-hand side. Um, this device is actually going in at the level of the skull. Um, there's a tray in there that holds the battery, and then there's uh, two ports. So you can put um, one in one location, one in the other, or both covering the same, same areas if the patient only has one seizure focus, uh, or we have the option of covering two different areas of, of seizure onset. Um, so placing this, uh, this uh, generator of this box and then the, the electrodes themselves. Um, and again, this is a closed loop uh, system. And you would use this again in, in drug resistant epilepsy and medication resistant epilepsy. So everything we're discussing obviously today is in patients who are not responding well to medications. Um, generally, we think of any type of neuromodulation when, when surgery is contraindicated because generally if, if there's a chance to make a person seizure free without um, causing any harm or, or dysfunction, um, that's generally the uh, gold standard. Um, RNS, obviously, if we have three foci, we can't, we don't have room for three electrodes on that generator, it may not be the best option. Um, and we also have to know where the seizure onset zone is. So most, so, so patients may need invasive monitoring, um, however, not everyone does. Most patients do not need invasive monitoring for RNS. There are some occasions when that's the case because we, need, we do need to know where the seizures are coming from again to be able to put these electrodes in the right place to be able to have a good closed loop system. So here's a great example of a, of a patient with bitemporal epilepsy and, and a great example of why this device uh, has been very, very helpful. Uh, and why it has opened up more surgery to patients who are not candidates for surgery. Well, this particular individual has uh, seizures from both temporal lobes. The temporal lobe um, on this right MRI scan being right here on the right-hand side and this being the left temporal lobe. Um, and if you look at this PET scan, the PET scan looks at glucose metabolism. It's basically looking at the brain's ability to use glucose or blood sugar um, Areas that are dark essentially mean areas that are relatively sick and not working well. Uh, those are epileptic areas, and you can see that's relatively dark on both sides compared to other areas in the brain which are bright. So we know uh, that if we uh, take out both temporal lobes in a patient, that they would have no memory. That's not something that we can do. That's not something that we would offer. So that that uh, so the option for that patient is to only take out one side and only reduce the seizures from one side then, um, leaving them with seizures on the other side. Uh, this was before the onset of RNS. And now standard treatment in most patients with bitemporal epilepsy is to, to place RNS with one electrode on each side, treating each, each temporal lobe. So again, that's a, that's a big advance and it certainly helped that group of, of patients. So here's another rule of two. This is a two-part surgery. So the first part is, um, making this uh, cranial opening, this scalp opening, um, exposing the bone and then cutting out the bone, but leaving the, the brain sac intact, uh, putting in this tray, which holds the generator, uh, and then the generator is placed in the tray. So placing the generators, part one, part two, all in the same setting, all in the same surgery is putting in the electrodes and hooking them up. Um, so the electrodes, as you can see here, this is that robotic arm again. So here I am placing the 
the uh, electrodes um, through the robotic arm, and then we then I attach them to the generator. And this is what that looks like on the on the 3D CT scan, on the plain X-ray, and then the bottom right, what it looks like on an MRI scan. <clears throat> So how is this device managed after surgery? Well, the neurologist has the ability in, in the clinic to non-invasively through this laptop and this transducer uh, to make adjustments to the stimulator so they can change uh, the de detection sensitivities and also stimulation settings uh, so that um, it, it can change and improve upon the way uh, the device can treat the seizure. So it can recognize them sooner and treat them better by making adjustments to those settings. The patient also has the ability at home uh, through a similar laptop to be able to download the data to uh, the net, uh, secure network uh, that the company has so that the uh, physician can look at all that data from uh, remotely. Um, patient obviously can't change any of the settings, um, but the, uh, cause that has to be done by the physician, but they have the ability to download the data so that it can be looked at remotely. Uh, and so that this, there can be this constant changing of the device as, as needed. And so looking at all comers for RNS, uh, the median seizure reduction, again, you're seeing this sort of graph over time of things increasing over time. Um, really by, you know, level three, level four, um, you're starting to see, it's starting to level off, uh, but it does increase to a 60 to 70 percent. Um, but there are sort of quartiles of patients who, who do have more benefit than that. So, so like I said, you know, you can have patients with uh, pretty significant seizure reduction and even patients that are seizure free or at least seizure free for a while uh, with different types of stimulators. So here about a quarter percent of patients, it says, uh, have more than a 90% reduction in seizures. And that, that's a significant uh, reduction. And that's a pretty good number of patients too, to have that uh, number of reduction. Um, you also see that uh, about a third of patients will actually have a seizure-free interval of around six months or so. So, you know, for six months, they might not have any seizures and then maybe they'll have one or two and then they have seizures for a little while and then maybe they'll go another six months. So um, they can have seizure-free periods for as long as six months and some even up to a year in and in 15% of patients or so. So vagus nerve stimulator is the only... Uh, non-cranial surgery that we have. So this is placed in the neck. So you're looking at an open neck surgery here, relatively small uh, incision of a, a couple inches uh, on the left neck, exposing the nerve, which is between the artery and the vein in the neck. Uh, and then that lead gets wrapped around the neck. Um, this is in, what I like to refer to uh, when I'm talking to patients as indirect brain stimulation. Uh, essentially what it's doing is using the vagus nerve to get stimulation into the brainstem uh, because all the nuclei for the vagus nerve sit in the brainstem and then there's connections on up to the other parts of the brain. So it's using the, uh, the vagus, the, the stimulator is using the vagus nerve to get into the brainstem and up into the brain uh, from being an outside the brain. And then the battery pack is, is placed in the chest. So you see the battery pack placed in the chest and the lead placed here. And this takes about an hour and 15 minutes to put in. Um, there's, Two different uh, main modes, there's a normal mode and then there's these demand modes. There's actually two demand modes now. The older models have one demand mode. Uh, the normal mode is this open uh, loop stimulation where it's sending stimulation for 30 seconds and then off for five minutes. It's just sending these, imp uh, these impulses at this pre-chosen rate that the physician chooses. And then there's this demand stimulation, which you can look at as like closing the loop or feeding back to some in some fashion. There's the magnet mode, which the, the patient is using. So it's, it's, um, it's manual from the patient. Patient feels something or the family sees something and it looks like a seizure. And then they swipe a magnet over the top of the generator. That sends an impulse for about <clears throat> 60 seconds at a higher intensity to try and abort that seizure. Auto stimulation is a newer mode. Um, it's been around, I think, maybe seven to 10 years. I don't remember exactly when it's come out, but it's been out for a while now. Um, it, it's, an, it's a nice thing because not everybody knows uh, they're going to have a seizure. Not everybody feels an aura and uh, not everybody is around somebody every time they have a seizure. So the auto stimulation, um, because this is on the left side where the heart is, this device is able to pick up on the heart rate and, and read the heart rate in the background. 
And then uh, if there's this rapid onset tachycardia or increased heart rate, that's associated with seizures in about two thirds of patients. Um, the device will automatically send an extra impulse to the, to the nerve to try and help abort the seizure. But again, this is you know, at, to the nerve and not necessarily to the brain, uh, but it, it's uh, again, using that nerve to get up to the brain. And what are the outcomes? They looked at this a little bit different. So these are the, the responder rates, meaning what, is the, what are the number of patients that have more than 50% reduction in seizures? 60%. So 60, 40, 20 rule. So 60% uh, of patients have more than 50% reduction in seizures. 40% of patients have more than 75, and then around 20% have more than a 90% reduction in patients. So again, you're seeing a good number of patients, uh, a relatively good number of patients having a, a pretty good outcome from, from a stimulator. Now we're gonna move from neuromodulation to um, either resections or ablations, things that are, we consider typically to be more curative treatments. Um, I've highlighted in green lesionectomy, lobectomy, and laser interstitial thermal therapy or laser ablation uh, in green because those are ones we're going to talk about today. Um, it, the laser ablation is new. Uh, lesionectomy is not uh, any, any newer, but I think with the advent of improving MRI, I think this will be continue to be uh, increasing. Um, and so that's one of the things that one of the advances. Uh, I think I'm, you know, I'm going to talk about lobectomy a little bit simply because temporal lobectomy, although it's not new, it's a, it's a great procedure with a high incidence of seizure freedom. Um, I'm not touching on multilobar resections and hemispherectomies. Those are big surgeries, uh, typically done more in the pediatric population. They've been around for decades. There's nothing new about them. The, the outcomes are very good um, for, the, for the selected patients that they're used in. So to understand a little bit about lobectomy, um, I need to talk to you a little bit about the lobes. There's four lobes of the brain. A lobectomy is essentially removal of one lobe. Uh, the temporal lobe sits here behind the eye, which is, would be here and above the ear, which is here. Um, the frontal lobe is behind the eye. Um, in this location, it goes all the way back to the vertex uh, or the, the top of the head here, which is parietal lobe. And then the occipital lobe is on the back of the head. So, so four main brain lobes. So the first temporal, uh, first lesion I wanna talk about is a cavernous malformation. This is a, a clearly visible lesion that looks abnormal. It looks like a piece of popcorn in here. Uh, this is the temporal lobe on this individual. Um, the black around, around this cavernous malformation is actually uh, blood staining. Um, so cavernous malformation is essentially a blood blister, sort of a low flow blood vessel abnormality, sort of leakage of blood vessel different than an AVM or, anterior, or, or arteriovenous malformation, which can be uh, a catastrophic uh, uh, brain hemorrhage. Uh, this, th these are tend to be more commonly associated with epilepsy. They leak blood and then they, they irritate the brain and then they can cause epilepsy. Uh, and they have about a 90% chance of, being, of rendering patients seizure free with removal. So the outcomes from removal of this device or removal of this lesion in patients with uh, epilepsy is quite high. And you can see the in, in this patient that's been removed uh, and this patient's been seizure free. Here's some um, information or here's some uh, EEG information that you would see on a intraoperative corticography or EEG at the time of surgery. This is a <clears throat> EEG done on the surface of the brain. Here on the left, um, so you see in these abnormal spikes, these tall spikes, and then after the area is removed, the abnormal area, you can see all this uh, high spikes uh, calm down to the point where you're not seeing any of those epileptic discharges anymore. The EEG looks much cleaner. And that's a good sign um, at the time of surgery that, that you've done what you need to do. You've removed the area that is causing the uh, the irritative focus and that, that the patient's likely to be seizure free. Here's another lesion. Uh, this is a focal cortical dysplasia, um, which is um, essentially an area, abnormal area of brain development. You can see that the left temporal lobe over on this side and the right side of the picture uh, is different than the right uh, temporal lobe here on the left side of the picture. Uh, in its appearance with this increased signal with white here and then this, these cystic areas 
Uh, this is a relatively large lesion. So this essentially removing this lesion is almost going to be like re doing a lobectomy. Uh, but patients with focal cortical dysplasia fare very well with surgery uh, as long as the abnormal areas can be removed. Sometimes the cortical dysplasias are so large that they, that they um, often um, are involved in areas that are important and can't be removed in those instances. Sometimes um, they, removing them do not render patients seizure free. Um, in some cases, a little bit of residual sometimes does not cause an issue. Here's one that's maybe not as obvious, although it's quite visible on this image. This is actually a pretty qu high quality uh, MRI scan. Um, this is a, a three Tesla. The, the um, MRI, the strength of an MRI magnet is measured in Tesla units. The three Tesla unit is a, is a, is a pretty good magnet uh, at this point. Um, in the past, you know, you would have been looking at maybe a 0 0.5 or a one Tesla magnet. Um, this may not be visible on, on that kind of uh, quality imaging. So a high quality imaging is going to pick up on this. And that's why I think that if we get uh, <clears throat> magnets that are even stronger, I think, you know, we're going to be able to pick up on lesions that maybe wouldn't even show up on this three Tesla magnet. In this particular individual, um, the area where the seizure came from was actually close to an area that controlled motor function. And so this patient had to have motor mapping with these electrode sheets placed on the surface of the brain. Then they underwent this resection and became seizure free uh, because this uh, area of seizure onset was not um, involved with the motor area. Um, and this patient and ended up having the same thing, focal cortical dysplasia, it just looked a little bit different. Um, here's a lesion in a different lobe of the brain, parietal lobe, like I said, high up on the, the back part of the head. Um, Again, it almost looks like a picture of focal cortical dysplasia, but some of these low-grade mixed tumors like a ganglioglioma or a DNET, uh, they're, they're often um, look very similar to um, these focal cortical dysplasias or areas of abnormal brain development, um, but they end up being low-grade tumors. And they're also uh, very common causes of epilepsy. And again, a lesionectomy is simply to be able to take that lesion out using uh, electrode recording at the time of surgery is typically uh, going to render the patient uh, seizure free. And so as long as it's um, in an area that's relatively silent and not uh, responsible for any important function, um, that patient won't end up with any deficits postoperatively. This patient did not end up with any deficits and he's been seizure free. He was a teenager at the time of uh, surgery. Uh, he's into adulthood now. So I wanted to talk about temporal lo lobectomy. Uh, temporal lobectomy is removal of the entire temporal lobe. Uh, this middle portion is the hippocampus. We, um, we call uh, hippocampal sclerosis. Also, we call it mesial temporal sclerosis or, um, or MTS. That is this increased white signal that you see here that I've circled in red. Um, that's a, a, a common cause of epilepsy. The most common uh, resective surgery for epilepsy is, is a temporal lobectomy. Um, 60 to 70 percent chance of being seizure free, as I'll show you in the data. Um, removal of the temporal lobe involves about four to five centimeters. So it's not actually the entire temporal lobe, but it's the front portion of the temporal lobe, um, including uh, the majority of the hippocampus. Um, there is another procedure called a, a selective uh, amygdala hippocampectomy, which is removal of the amygdala, which is anteriorly here, and the hippocampus, which is further back here. And that's just a, a selective removal of this stuff through surgery in the mid middle portion of the temporal lobe rather than removing the entire temporal lobe. And in, in selective in individuals, sometimes that's enough. Uh, we do need to have information from video EEG to determine really if that's gonna render the patient seizure free um, as, as the seizure free uh, rates are not the same as with uh, a, a com complete temporal lobectomy. <clears throat> So here's the New England Journal of Medicine uh, study, although, you know, from 22 years ago. So this data has been out for a while. This is a, a very well done study in Canada, a randomized trial of, of, uh, of temporal lobe surgery for epilepsy. Uh, and you can see that patients were randomized to, to temporal lobectomy, became six, uh, seizure free 60% of the time versus less than 10% uh, for medical management. Um, 
So this is a, you know, uh, a very highly effective surgery. Now I'm gonna talk about uh, laser ablation, which is using laser heat to cause destruction. Uh, this image that you're seeing here, this uh, lesion is what we call a hamartoma. It's another area of abnormal brain development. Uh, and what you see here in circled in red, it, that you can see sort of bulging into this fluid space in the brain is, is a hamartoma. It's pretty small and fairly subtle. <clears throat> it's in an area called the hypothalamus. This is very deep in the brain. Um, and and uh, the, the risks of surgical resection of this are, are very, very high and not something that uh, most people do these days. Uh, but the laser ablation is a great way to get to that. Uh, laser ablation is a way to use a, a laser that has the uh, thickness of, I would say, typically it's about the, the diameter of like half the thickness of a pencil. Um, that laser fiber is implanted um, through a two-part procedure where the laser fiber is put stereotactically or with ro robotic guidance, essentially in the operating room with the patient asleep through a small opening in the uh, skin and bone. Um, and then the patient on still under anesthesia goes down to the MRI scanner and, the, <clears throat> and then with the use of specific sequences on, on the MRI scan uh, called thermography, which are essentially heat maps, the ability to look at basically temperature maps on the MRI scan, uh, the laser is used to ablate tissue um, down in the MRI scanner. Uh, typically the patient goes home the next day. Uh, literally the incision is a half inch, uh, requires one single stitch to close. So <clears throat> it's uh, what we call minimally invasive, although I, you know, I kind of put that in quotes sometimes because obviously this is still, still brain surgery and there are still risks to it. Uh, it's just not a big open open surgery to get to it. It certainly carries less risk for these hamartomas and some other some other lesions. Um, here's what it looks like placing the laser fiber under stereotactic guidance with the use of the robot. Um, <clears throat> the electrode is or the uh, robot um, drilling with the robot upper left, placing the um, uh, placing the, the bolt in place. And then here on the bottom left, you can see I'm placing the uh, laser fiber through that bolt. Uh, so here on the, on the right, you can see that this is the only place that this, uh, there's been an incision. Uh, this is uh, where the laser fiber is entering and then it's being directed down through the brain that you can see this black line into that area. You can see how deep that is in the brain. You can see that if we were to do an open surgery, how far we would have to go in order to get that really small area out. Um, so you can see what a great treatment this is to be able to just get this laser fiber in that location. Here you can see it just as a single dot. Um, and then <clears throat> we can, so we can confirm before the laser is used to, to heat up the area that this is in the right place. So we see the laser is in the correct place. This is a workstation. Uh, that that, um, that uh, we work with. Uh, so we see all the heat maps on this. Uh, the MRI gives us these heat maps. So we see these, uh, and we're specifically now we're seeing this gold color is the area that's being painted in during the treatment. So after the area is ablated, um, it'll paint out the area that has, has, has met this time and temperature algorithm to say, hey, this tissue has been under heat long enough that this tissue is no longer functional. So we know we've destroyed that, that lesion and you can get a scan afterwards with giving dye. And then you see this contrast enhancing area and then this area of swelling around it. So we know that we've treated the area successfully just by getting an immediate MRI after the treatment. We can also do this for, you know, so I mentioned this uh, selective amygdala hippocampectomy that's uh, ablating or that's um, removing the amygdala in the hippocampus. That's in the upper right picture, that's getting to it with an open surgery um, in, in one of three different ways, either through a cleft, right through the middle of the brain, or trying to get under the brain uh, and doing retraction to get out this that's deep in there. Um, and so this could be done with an open surgery. But nowadays, we don't if we're if we're going to do this selectively, if the patient's a candidate for that rather than an open temporal or a standard temporal lobectomy, then we can place the laser fiber in. Uh, to the hippocampus, uh, 
essentially uh, spearing that uh, through the long axis of the hippocampus. And then the, you're seeing the um, post-treatment scan with the enhancement around it. So you see that area that's been treated. This is where the hippocampus was on the right-hand side. This is where it is on the left-hand side. That area will be all cleaned up by the by the body's natural healing over the course of three to six months. And this will just, this will just fill in with a spinal fluid um, and just be a, you know, a, a normal absent space at that point. So based on, on what I've seen and what I see coming in the future, this is, this is sort of my prognostication about the future here is that um, I, I think there'll be some advances in, in home EEG monitoring. I know that Going into the video EEG, um, going into the EMU for video EEG monitoring is not the, the most fun thing to do. Um, I think there'll be some advances in the ability to do home video monitoring that will allow telemetry to be a little bit um, a little bit uh, better and provide a little bit better data than it that it currently can just by scalp EEG alone because the clinical picture with the video is very important as well. Um, I think we're gonna see continued improvements of imaging qualities, which I'm, I mentioned. So I think that uh, lesions, um, which uh, are quite subtle now will be obvious and lesions, which we can't pick up now, uh, I think we're gonna start seeing, which is gonna to lead to less need for invasive monitoring. It's also gonna to lead to, um, le to smaller surgeries. Uh, I think also we're going to see improvements in the ability to modulate seizure networks with uh, closed loop stimulation. So we may continue to see, I've, I've seen in my practice with the onset of RNS and, and these other stimulator devices, a decrease in, uh, in resections because of the efficacy of some of these new devices. I think that, you know, over time, these devices will only get better. Um, and I think that, you know, we'll, I think we'll be doing uh, less resective surgery, at least smaller resective surgery. Um, and then I, I see that there's some potential for artificial intelligence assistance with uh, EEG workup and treatment, uh, or seizure treatment and, and, uh, and workup and from a standpoint of all the data that um, the neurologists have to go through with the EEG uh, ictal onset, and then all the data between seizures and everything, and also localizing where the seizure starts, where it's spreading to. I think uh, artificial intelligence can uh, can assist by uh, scanning through this data and providing points of interest for the for the physician to look at and review. Um, <clears throat> being able to collect then more data and and go through it faster. Uh, I also think my my time of spending two hours planning electrodes uh, for the stereo EEG will uh, decrease. Uh, not only that, I think the, um, the artificial intelligence will allow us to be able to um, implant uh, stereo EEG electrodes in a specific fashion based on the EEG. You can see putting in the EEG data into the artificial intelligence and uh, getting a stereo EEG plan that I could then review and, and, and make sure that I like and that would be consistent with typical placement and safe to do in the operating room. Um, and I also think that there's, uh, I know that there's a lot of studies currently going out on artificial intelligence, reading MRI scans and picking up on abnormalities and things like that. Um, that obviously is somewhat easier to do for, for obvious lesions like tumors that really stand out on MRI scans, but I think the as artificial intelligence get better and the, uh, the ability to scan MRIs for subtle abnormalities and picking up on asymmetries, I think that has the ability to pick up on, on some of these lesions as well. And so overall, I think that potentially less need for uh, invasive monitoring and smaller surgeries. So in conclusion, we're basically coming back to the slide I began with is that uh, what's new these days or what are the advances well, we have higher quality brain MRIs. Hopefully I've showed you that, showing you these lesions. Uh, I've also showed you that, you know, uh, stereo EEG is a less invasive way to, to do invasive monitoring. Uh, still electrodes in the brain, but it's not requiring an op a large open surgery on the brain anymore. Um, also showed you some lesions and some tailored resections as well as uh, laser ablations and laser treatments. We talked about robotic, robotic guidance in the operating room and how that works talked about the advances in neuromodulation and electrical stimulation, specifically the advent of uh, DBS and RNS, neither of which were available for epilepsy when I first started practice. 
here at Penn State. Um, RNS being the first closed loop type of stimulation for epilepsy, a feedback system that's very effective. And now DBS being approved for epilepsy in the last few years. Um, and obviously being out for, for decades for the treatment of movement disorders like Parkinson's disease. Um, it, in essence, uh, uh, we have now more options in the past, as I showed you with that patient with uh, bitemporal epilepsy who really didn't have a great option in the past. Now we have RN, bitemporal RNS. Uh, so we have options now that we didn't have for, for patients who um, couldn't have a surgical resection and, and, uh, and, and, and finally, I think that um, surgery is becoming less invasive, less risky, and, and even more beneficial to patients as, as we learn more. And now I know that um, Ellen was collecting some, some questions, so I'm gonna stop sharing the screen here and uh, see what questions I can answer. Oh my, it just disappeared on me, oh <laughs> my. The questions. Oh, come on. Sorry about this. No problem. Thank you all for listening. I hope uh, I hope it's been informative and uh, you've got some of the information you were looking for. And, and obviously, um, we'll, we'll go through the questions that have uh, have, have come up that I, this will be, I know, posted. Um, if you want to re-review the, the slides, I think you're going to get the handouts of the slides as well as uh, the video will be posted. So you'll be able to watch again and review some of the information uh, again. Yes, thank you. For some reason, I've lost my questions. I had them right up here on the screen. Uh, just give me a second. Sure, no problem. <clears throat> I know one of the questions was, um, is there any surgical options for people um, that have absence seizures? Um, well, absence, like st strictly absence seizures, if it's, um, you know, there are absence seizures that are as associated with, uh, various epilepsy conditions, such as, you know, temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, patients often have absence seizures. So, uh, so from a standpoint of, as long as it's a localization related epilepsy, something like that, then, then the answer is yes. Uh, if those seizures are from, you know, a, um, uh, a specific genetic condition, it, it may not be, but if it's from a temporal lobe epilepsy, it, um, it clearly and, and truly is, uh, um, uh, beneficial for different types of surgical interventions. All right. Still can't find these questions. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Um, I'm sorry about this. Let me think, do it from my memory. Um, what are the ages for, for the deep brain stimulator and all those neurostimulators? What's the minimum age for, trip, for a, a patient to get that? Yeah, that's... Um... That's a good question. There's the FDA labeling, and then there's like, what do we actually do in clinical clinical practice? Um, uh, and uh, I can tell you that that I've looked at the FDA labeling a little uh, more recently on the DBS because it's been more recently approved. Um, so that is age 18 um, is what it states. Um, the um, VNS used to be 18, and I think they've well, and then it went down to 12 and I believe it's eight now. Um, and um, responsive neurostimulation, the, the cutoff for that, they've recently done other studies that I think they've now dropped that down to 12. Uh, I don't um, keep all those numbers specifically in my head because, you know, nothing we do in clinical practice is, is specifically, you know, we don't, uh, we don't have the FDA dictate how we practice medicine. The FDA can only approve uh, devices for, for what they were studied for in a particular study. Um, so I can, I can tell you that as long as something is safe um, and it's indicated for that patient, then, then we'll vouch for that patient. Uh, if, there's an, if there's some issue with their insurance company being sticklers about their age, 
um, then, um, you know, we would, we would fight for that patient. So I'll give you an example. So, um, the, so far the only uh, DBS I've done has been in the, you know, uh, upper teenage and adult population. Um, the, the, the youngest VNS patient that I've ever had and, and operated on was two years old. Um, so we do VNS at any age and I've never had any issues with, uh, performing VNS at, at any age, uh, that patients would present at. Um, so that's never really been a insurance issue. Uh, when RNS first came out, I had a patient that was 10 years old. Um, she had to work with a lawyer and fight the insurance company with us for approximately a year and a half, uh, until we could get that approved, but we fought for that. Uh, now with further studies, they, they've lowered the labeling age. Um, but as long as the, you know, the patient's skull is not too thin and too young for that. Um, so, you know, eight to 10 is probably a good, potentially a good cutoff, but they have a, if they have a thicker skull, uh, they may be candidates for the RNS at a, at a younger age. Um, someone commented that their surgery was invasive. Do some hospitals always do invasive surgery and some others maybe focus on you know, how's that work in different hospitals? Well, um, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I, I, you know, for uh, the way I look at it is that, you know, the gold standard of, of, of epilepsy surgery, surgery to treat patients with epilepsy is, you know, we typically want patients to be seizure free. Um, and the, the typical uh, surgery to do that is a resective surgery. And, and those are certainly more invasive. Um, but the, the landscape has changed, which is, is what I was trying to show with this. So that, uh, you know, over the last 10, 10 to 15 years, um, it seems like um, we're doing less invasive things now than we did in the past. Now, that's not to say that, that there are still patients, as you can see from, from my um, slide set that I, you know, there was a patient that I had the subdural electrodes implanted on because that patient had um, uh, seizures coming from a, an area that was, was controlling motor function. And we needed to know, we needed to map that area out to make sure it was safe to resect it. Uh, the key, whether or not a surgery is invasive or not, the way I look at it is, you know, you can do a, um, I guess the definition of an invasive versus non-invasive, sometimes the lines are sort of blurred on those sorts of things. Um, uh, you know, because you could do a minimally invasive surgery, but have a, a bad outcome. Um, so if, if you did a, if you had a laser ablation surgery that was, you know, from a skin standpoint was just a small incision, but it was not, you know, it was uh, not performed correctly or was in the wrong place, then it could cause some damage. And regardless of it's minimally invasive, it, it, it caused problems. Or if it was in the, you know, it, it was the, uh, it was, the surgery was poorly chosen and it didn't help the seizures, then you had a minimally invasive surgery, but it didn't work. So uh, sometimes, you know, the in, more invasive surgeries are just indicated. I, I certainly the um, uh, certain the types of surgeries may be different at, at um, from place to place. I think at a lot of level four epilepsy centers, they're going to offer all of the things that we talked about. Um, uh, not every place will offer everything that we that we talked about. Um, some of the level three epilepsy centers, for instance, like I said, won't, they don't do grids uh, so, or invasive monitoring and they, they don't do like uh, temporal lobectomies um, uh, or um, like RNS, but uh, they may offer other types of resections and such. But um, so I think that it, it there is, sometimes some variability from place to place. I, I guess it's just a matter of what is the strategy and the hypothesis about where the seizures are coming from. Does it make sense? Is it gonna uh, help the seizures and is the patient gonna be seizure free from it or de diminish seizures? Because nobody wants to be seizure free and then have a, you know, a, a detrimental effect, uh, a significant uh, complication. Okay. The, the chart that you showed, the long-term efficacy of uh, stimulation for drug-resistant partial epilepsy, remember that chart? Yeah. Um, someone, 
made a comment based on that last chart. Is it becoming more common to skip over regular surgery and go straight to DVS? Um, I, I think are we, I think we were talking about the um, the pie chart with. Uh, oh, okay. I think are, are, were we talking about the the pie chart or the or the DBS data? I just took note of the the chart you were the um, slide that you were on when they asked the question, so it might have been another slide entirely. Yeah, I think that the um, the um, I wouldn't say no. I mean. The, the point of the um, that slide the the pie chart about you know drug uh, drug resistance and when is somebody meet medically refractory epilepsy I think that's probably what the question was no okay somebody said it's the chart with the bar graph um, well I mean if you look at the, the 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 data from all the different types of stimulators they are very similar um, you know in that as far as the amount of seizure reduction between uh, the different devices. In other words, you know, you're looking at, if you're looking at DBS versus VNS, did there look like there was much of a difference between outcomes on that? Um, it, it didn't overall, if you put it all together, they, you know, they, they were both had around 60 to 70% seizure freedom. Uh, but I guess it's really, you know, the, the trouble is that these are, this is grouped data, so it's not individualized. So, you know, um, and we, we also know that not everybody um, responds to a, a VNS. Some people respond great to VNS. And um, the problem is we don't have any way to know if somebody's going to respond to a VNS or not. Most of the patients that I've done DBS on are patients that have already had a VNS and it just didn't work that well for them. So we've done you know a non-cranial surgery and it just didn't give them the results they wanted. And so um, or the results we hope for either, and then we move forward with a, a cranial surgery. But the, the, so I'm not sure if that answers the question or, um, but the whole, the whole point is that all the neurostimulator devices are, are very effective at reducing seizures. Uh, and there's a subset of patients that do very, very well with them. Uh, it's just sometimes hard to know uh, who that patient's going to be. Um, and so just because somebody's failing a medication doesn't necessarily mean that DBS would be the best option. Um, VNS may work great for them too. Or if we know the seizure, where the seizures are coming from, RNS might be a better option. I tend to think that um, if we know where the seizures are coming from and if we put an electrode in that same spot, I think really it makes sense in my mind why that would be the best, hold the best uh, efficacy. What about if you uh, have a VNS and you exercise and your heart rate goes up? Will that set it off? Um, there can be some false positives, but um, there's sensitivity settings on that. So I didn't get into all the details of that, but there, there are sensitivity settings that can be adjusted. Um, the, um, in essence, the way that the uh, device is working is it's taking constant averages. So if, if, if you exercise enough or if people, people that do exercise and they watch their heart rate a lot during exercise, uh, you'll notice that when you first start exercising, your heart rate's not that much above normal. Uh, and it takes a pretty hard work to get your heart rate uh, up there. So it's actually a sl pretty slow rise of your heart rate during exercise compared to uh, a seizure. So the, the device has an algorithm where it's do taking constant averages of the heart rate. And so it's able to detect uh, with pretty good accuracy when someone's having, uh, you know, when have, somebody has this rapid onset tachycardia versus when they're just getting excited or when they're exercising or something where it makes the heart rate just go up a little bit more slowly. Um, that being said, there can be some false positives when that's the case. If there's too many, then there's some just, there's some adjustments uh, in the sensitivity that can be done in the clinic. Um, but that is not um, necessarily a harmful thing. We don't, we don't want it to like stimulate too much just because it uses up the battery unnecessarily, but it's not harmful to the patient uh, because it only is able to do that extra stimulation for 60 seconds. Um, and it's, uh, it's not a lot higher than the, the standard uh, background setting. Is motor mapping invasive and is that done prior to surgery? Uh, motor mapping, if it needs to be done, is, is usually and oftentimes is going to require uh, grids uh, like that 
uh, sheet of electrodes that's placed on the surface of the brain so that we can stimulate them. And as we can actually stimulate those electrodes and if it's sitting over like the area for the, for, for instance, if it's sitting over the area, that grid is sitting over the area that controls hand function and we stimulate it, it's gonna make the hand move. Um, so it's important to get that mapping done so we can see, okay, the seizure starts from this particular electrode, but the motor function is from here. Uh, is it far enough away? Does the seizure involve that motor area? So a lot of times that does involve a grid. There is some mapping that can be done with stereo EEG, but it's a little bit harder because with um, subdural electrodes, the, the uh, electrodes are packed closer together. So you can get a little bit more accurate data with that. So a lot of times if, if, um, if you're trying to map motor function, that's typically done with, um, with grids. The alternative to that is, is doing like an awake surgery, which obviously would be an invasive surgery too. You'd be awake and do the mapping awake under surgery. Uh, what is the difference between a lesion and scar tissue? Uh, well, when people refer to scar tissue, a lot of times I think they're probably referring to, um, well, a scar tissue would be a type of lesion. So if there's scar tissue, for instance, from a prior brain surgery of some kind, like removal of a tumor, or maybe there has been a head trauma and there's been some scar tissue that, that got, um, uh, that developed after that, um, that would be like if there's scar tissue that we visualize, that would be a lesion. So when I put lesion in quotes, it doesn't mean it's a tumor. It just means there's something there, a spot on the imaging that we see, and that spot may be the cause of the epilepsy. So it could be, you know, it could be a, it could be a tumor. It could be a this malformation of cortical development. It could be this blood blister or cavernous malformation thing that I showed you a picture of. It, it could be scar tissue from. Uh, from a head trauma or from previous surgery or something like that. Is there any damage or deficits caused by the stereo EEG? Um, it's intended to not cause damage. The only caveat to that would be um, if there were some complication like a bleed, um, which would be, you know, it's, it's not 0%. The risk is low. Um, but it's, it's certainly there. It's usually a quote that's somewhere around less than 1% chance. Um, the, the reason that we do the particular uh, imaging that we do with the MRI and the CAT scan is, is we're looking for blood vessels. And then when I'm spending the two hours planning it, where I'm planning the electrode is I'm planning it around, away from blood vessels so I can see the blood vessels on the scan, the arteries and the veins, and we're staying away from the big ones when I'm planning it. Uh, so that they're in a relatively avascular area. So that's the, what makes it is, uh, and then the robot being very accurate um, in its guidance allows it to be uh, pretty much on point with where I planned it. So we know that if we planned it in an avascular fashion or away from blood vessels, and then I'm using a robot that's very accurate to guide it, it makes it as risk-free as possible, but not 0%. A woman commented that she had laser ablation in 2019. The doctor said to her recently that if he knew what he knew now back then, he probably wouldn't su have suggested it to her. Um, I don't know if there's a question there, but I just thought I'd read her comment. But has you know, it, I guess everything's changing every day. Would that be a safe assumption? Yeah. Um... So I don't know exactly, obviously, what the what the comment meant. Um, maybe that uh, meant that the doctor learned more about her epilepsy, and, and I think maybe so. She, maybe she needed a bigger surgery at that point. So that's one of those things that we're always trying to, you know, differentiate. Does does the patient is the patient going to be benefited by taking the entire temporal lobe out, or can we ablate the middle portion of it, like the just the hippocampus and and make a patient seizure free. So the way I look at it and the way I talk to patients about it um, and the way patients look at, at it, sometimes they're a little bit different, but the way I look at it is like, if you look at the data behind chance of being seizure free with, um, with a laser ablation of the hippocampus, um, it's about 50%. Um, and that's in the, in the data behind a temporal lobectomy, a standard te temporal lobectomy is a 70% chance of seizure free. So that means that you know there's a higher chance of a patient being seizure-free with a temporal lobectomy, 
And the reason for that is a lot of patients that have temporal lobe epilepsy, um, it's throughout most of the temporal lobe. And if we only take part of it out, we're, we're, we may be taking out the onset, but not the early spread. Uh, and if you remember when I talked about that, if we don't get the onset and the early spread, that we're not going to have an effect on the epilepsy um, very, for very long term. So somebody might have a benefit for a short period of time, but then it might, it might go away. So I, I certainly have had a patient to um, have a laser ablation of the hippocampus. Um, and it's not, you know, it's obviously it's a surgery, it's a brain surgery, so it, it can't be minimized, uh, but it's less invasive than an open surgery. Um, in as long as we talk in the group, uh, in the conference and think, okay, this patient's epilepsy based upon the EEG seems to be a really, really slow spread. We think it's in the hippocampus for long enough that we think we can make the patient seizure free with, uh, ablation of the hippocampus. Um, then we would offer them ablation of the hippocampus. Now, if they, um, if they have the ablation, um, and they become seizure free, then, then that's it. You know, they've, they've gotten away, if you will, with a, a smaller operation. Uh, but if for some reason they don't, um, the, uh, laser ablation, uh, get benefit from the laser ablation or the seizures come back, um, the, the, the temporal lobectomy can be done after a laser ablation. So you haven't necessarily burned any bridges. This will be the last question. Okay. Um, can I can a person feel when the RNS and the VNS is stimulating? Um, the RNS, not not uh, not typically, wouldn't be expected. Um, the um, because the most of the time these these are not we're not putting electrodes in like uh, what we call eloquent areas. We're not putting it like in the speech area or the motor function area, the sensory function area, or even uh, sometimes when we do, uh, patients still don't. Uh, notice a feeling when that happens. Um, so no, because the brain doesn't necessarily really, you know, the brain doesn't necessarily have in itself have feelings. So it doesn't, um, unless it's like stimulating uh, a particular area of the brain um, with too much stimulation. So, so there's some parameters that can be adjusted. If, if we're, if we have to place electrodes right over the motor function or the speech area, <clears throat> then there's some uh, particular settings that we can utilize to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, with a VNS, uh, sometimes uh, patients, a lot of times patients will feel it going off, um, uh, but it's usually not painful. We start the settings low and then increase it over time. So patients might feel, and not everybody does, uh, some patients don't notice much, but most patients will feel just a tiny little, almost like a little twinge or something in the neck. Um, not painful, just enough to know that you know, when their VNS is going off, but it's not bothersome. Um, if it's, if it's bothersome or, for, or painful, then the settings are too high and we don't leave things at that setting. So there, there is a multitude of settings that can be, be done on the VNS. And we basically start it low and titrate it slow to the seizure effect. And then also we consider the tolerance of the patient. So, uh, if, if, the set, if the certainly if the stimulation is too high, they're definitely going to feel it, and it and it can be painful. Uh, but as long as it's um, at, a, at a at a pretty normal setting, the patient might know when it goes off, um, but it's usually not bothersome. Um, just so you know, there's all this feedback saying great presentation. They really enjoyed it. I think there's a patient here that got. Um, uh, surgery nine years ago from you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And uh, you, she says that you're the best man for the job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't pay her. For, I didn't pay her for that. So uh -huh. I no, I appreciate everybody's uh, uh, everybody listening and taking the time to listen in. And uh, hopefully you learned a lot. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you again for the invitation. And thank you for taking such a, a you know, time out to this for this presentation that was really long. <laughs> it was wonderful with all these. Oh, questions. You're, you're welcome. I'm yeah. I'm I'm excited about epilepsy surgery, and I'm excited about all the advances. I'm excited about you know what we can look forward into for the future of epilepsy patients because it's 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 a tough disease for patients, and and it's uh, a tough disease to treat. Um, and it's 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 a very unique disease because the brain is so complicated, and seizures can be various so varied from patient to patient. 
So, um, but I think with all these devices and all these new technologies uh, coming along, I, th I think there's been a, a huge number of strides over the last uh, 10, 15 years since uh, I've been doing this uh, in the things that have changed with epilepsy surgery. And I, I think that the, the future looks even brighter, so. Well, thank you for your dedication to epilepsy. Well, um, everyone, I hope you have a great night and thank you again, doctor. It was, a, it was wonderful to have you here tonight. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye.